welcome to I Am Concordia. I'm Amanda Starnino. And I'm Andrew Tevendale. Our top story, Concordia President Claude Lajeunesse resigned on September 18th. The Concordia administration announced the resignation through a press release on its website saying it was by mutual agreement. La Jeunesse has been at Concordia for four years and prior to that was president of Ryerson University. CSU executive Noah Stewart joins us live for comment. Noah, it's no secret that he wasn't exactly popular among the students. What's the reaction been so far? Um, I think students and the people I've talked to and they've expressed to me are very happy at the turn of events. I think people really felt that La Jeunesse was out of touch with them and was out of touch with their values. And I think that they're really hoping that we'll be able to move forward for Concordia and get a new president who's more in sync with the way they feel this university is and what they want to see this university become. Well, the fact that he wanted to raise tuition fees didn't help much either. Yeah, he called, I mean, last year referred to students as a pampered minority, which I don't think is something you want to be calling your constituency who pays for your salary. But beyond that, it's the attitude that students can't afford to pay more, the students here have lots of money, and it's completely out of touch with the reality. Concordia is a very working class environment with a population that can't afford thousands of dollars in tuition increases, fundamentally. There's already lots of students that can't afford food, can't afford their books after they pay their tuition, can't afford their rent. I mean, we see it every day talking to students who have these problems, and they certainly don't think that they can afford to pay these additional fees. The Lajeunesse seems, as reason seems to think it's reasonable for them to pay. Well, Noah, we're almost out of time, but one last question. Will students, will students have any input on who the next president of Concordia will be? Well, a hiring committee is going to be taking place. Um, sitting on it will be the Concordia Student Union President, Michelle Kinaboa, as well as the president of the Graduate Students Association. So there will be students involved in the hiring process. We'll be going to our constituency and asking them what they want to see in the president, what they think the leader of their university that they pay for and they're part of, what they think that person should embody and what they think their value should be. Well, Noah, thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you for having me. Last Friday, Concordia held its 18th annual shuffle to raise funds for student scholarships and bursaries. The event began in the Engineering, Computer Science and Visual Arts Complex on St. Catherine Street. Hundreds of Concordians, including faculty, staff and students, geared up with a shuffle t-shirt and a bottle of water. After a quick warm-up, they headed out towards Sherbrooke Street to make their way to the Loyola campus. At the end of the afternoon, the event raised over $40,000. It's been over a year since the Dawson shooting and students are beginning to heal as Maria Barilaro found out in this special report on life after Dawson. For students in Montreal, September 13th will always be a day to remember. For journalists, it seems to be a day they can't forget. Just over a year ago, Dawson College students received the shock of a lifetime when a mysterious gunman opened fire on them. His name was Kim Veer Gill. His mission was to kill. James Santos was 17 years old. He sat in the atrium chatting with his friend Anastasia D'Souza. The man with the gun turned to D'Souza and shot her in the abdomen. He then turned to Santos and demanded Santos follow him. For 18 minutes, Santos walked around the college with a gun to his back. It was sort of like his human shield. And... Um and then after that, he, he spoke to me a couple of times, and then he told me to take his bag, carry it with him, and uh, with this other with this other boy. And after that, he got shot, and he, he got shot by the cops on the arm, and then he fell down on the floor, and then he took the gun underneath his chin, took his own life. 18-year-old D'Souza was killed. 20 other students were injured. Thousands were traumatized. Every Montrealer knows what happened that day. But few know the day of the shooting was only the beginning of the nightmare for some. I was just bothered that the media was showing him, that they were once again idolizing, the, idolizing him and showing information when I don't think they should have. I thought it was just sort of dumb. I think they should have just concentrated on what happened in Dawson, like sort of just mention it a couple of times, him, but not actually like showing pictures and going deep into, uh, deep into him. Santos feels the media coverage of the killer only made forgetting the terror of that day even harder for him in the first few days following the shooting. Khalid Juma was the president of the Concordia Student Union at the time of the shooting. Within minutes after the shooting began, Juma and a few other CSU representatives ran down the Maisonneuve Street to Dawson College. Juma and others rushed the frantic students down the Maisonneuve Street directing them toward Concordia's hall building for safety. Juma had thought the shooting itself was traumatizing enough, 
But when he got back to Concordia, he realized a whole new problem was beginning to unfold. And the biggest thing actually was um, the media. There was, within minutes, um, our whole campus was scattered with media and there were all these traumatized students coming over who didn't want to be filmed, who didn't want to be interviewed, who didn't want anything like that. So we, we put up a kind of a, a student blockade of sorts to block out media from coming onto the terrace and left media off the premise at all times. And, and that in itself was a battle that we had to face, um, which kind of also added a really different element of pressure to the situation because we were no longer just doing now there were people consistently watching filming taking pictures and it kind of it really intensified the environment that much more juma thinks the media did play a role in the lives of the young students he saw in the days and weeks following the shooting the media reported more and more about it the killer's name was becoming a household name um in terms of media coverage there was a really in-depth portion of the media dedicated to who this guy was, the life that he had lived, the way that he, he kind of had come to this point. And I think that um, by the end of it, it was kind of like beating a dead horse. Um, all the information had been extracted very early on into kind of into the divulgence of his character. Um, and it just became kind of sensational after a while that every media station, every radio station, every pr source of print media had to cover him in some which way to talk about his distorted sense of reality and all these things. I don't necessarily think that helped the Dawson community. Some students were disturbed and some even afraid to go back to the college. The students still needed to grieve before they could move on. So they grieved. And the entire city of Montreal grieved with them. Students, parents, teachers, friends and even strangers lined the outside walls of Dawson College with flowers, showing their support for one another and for the young woman who was killed. Was the media wrong to report on the killer? Was the media wrong to show his face over and over again? Or are people overlooking an even bigger issue? Like any story, this one also has two sides. Professor Robert Soroka was teaching at Dawson College on the day of the shooting. He was also teaching at Polytechnique on December 6th, 1989, when 14 women were shot dead in their classroom. Soroka is now finding himself in the same position he was in after the Polytechnique massacre, trying to spread the word about the faculty and staff, a topic everyone seems to have missed. We lose sight of the fact that there are, that even though we're older, even though we're more experienced, we're also stakeholders and we also feel the pain and we might feel even more pain because uh, I think what hurts more is not getting is is that we uh, we felt we were helpless when people who we are charged with caring for were actually uh, were, were actually victimized why were the students hurt and why aren't why were we privileged to walk out unscathed and uh, for many of us, it, it was a very debilitating feeling. And I could tell you for myself, it's a feeling I, I still experience. I remember everything, but mostly I remember sort of like my friend that passed away. Just the moment just before it all happened. Like For I Am Concordia, I'm Maria Barilaro. Wow, I can't believe it's already been over a year. That day is still so fresh in my memory. Likewise. We'll be back after this. Coming up, homecoming football and your sports scores. Did the Stingers win? Find out after the break. He sat me down and so began The story of a charmless man Do you know who Claude Lajeunesse is? No. Y you have zero idea? No idea. Do you think you would be able to pick him out of a picture? I have three pictures here uh, and I'll show them to you. Maybe you can pick him out? Pretty sure I couldn't. I know he's an old white man. That's about it. Alright, well let's try it out anyway. Okay. I think that's him. Yeah. This, one. this one? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know who Claude Lajeunesse is? Yes. And you know his position in Concordia? Well, he's just resigned as the president. Do you know why he resigned? No. I actually 
All I heard is that he had problems with some board members, or do you know? Uh, I guess it would be this one. That one? No? One more guess. You know, this could be like Paul Martin's triplets. I mean, I'm not... I'm guessing... Uh, I guess. I'd say... We're gonna go, we're gonna go for this one. Bingo! Yeah, is it right? Yeah, Oh, yeah, yeah nice. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, really, that was just a complete guess. Welcome back. As everybody knows, this weekend is Thanksgiving. And when you say Thanksgiving, you think turkey. But instead of doing the same old thing this year, why not do things with an Italian twist? Our own Amanda Starnino hooked up with a mom, but not just any mom, but our own Giovanni Bertolo's mother for a stuffing recipe, Italian style. As we all know, Thanksgiving is all about eating. Joining us today is Mary Abate, and she's about to show us her most renowned turkey stuffing. Thanks for joining us today, Mary. It's my pleasure. Welcome to my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get started. If you'll hand me the chopped there gizzards. You know. So this goes in the pan and we lightly saute this meat with the chopped minced pork. So what we do next is we remove the meat with a slotted spoon to leave the fat on the bottom. After setting the cooked meat aside, take the apples, onions and celery and cook them for a few minutes. If you'll hand me the soaked bread, it's a baguette or an Italian panini as they call it. It's soaked in milk and squeezed. So we put this at the bottom of the pan. Then we add the meat mixture. And then everything will come together. We add all the ingredients that we cook. So you mix everything by hand. You can feel the texture. Mm -hmm. um, it's better to mix this way. Okay, so Amanda, I'm gonna start stuffing it and you're gonna help me. This okay. is the fun part. <laughs> so you take some stuffing. The bird, by the way, I have to say, has been washed, mm -hmm. uh, dried with a Scott towel, rubbed with butter, and the inside, the cavity, we put salt and garlic powder. Okay. This is fun. <laughs> Gotta make sure my mom doesn't see this, so she'll have me cook Thanksgiving dinner next year. Oh, it's fun, <laughs> you'll enjoy it. <laughs> So that's great, you did a wonderful job. All right. It's very simple. So we put the turkey in the oven. Thank you. And how long does that need to stay there? Um, about approximately an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. at, at what temperature? At 350. Wow, I must say, Mary, this looks delicious. It smells amazing too. Thank you. Shall we? Sure. Mmm, looks great. Tastes even better. Mmm. Mm. There's nothing like homemade turkey stuffing. Let's make a toast. Yes. And from our kitchen cheers, happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Boy, did that look delicious. It was really good. Tell Giovanni's mom I'm coming over for supper sometime soon. <laughs> While it's Thanksgiving for some, thousands of other students across the world are observing the Muslim holiday of Ramadan. The Muslim Student Association at Dawson College held a Ramadan dinner last Thursday. The dinner was free of charge and gave students an opportunity to eat their meal together on campus. So we want to we wanna serve uh, the community, not necessarily Muslims. Like I said, everybody's invited. They can, uh, they can uh, come join us to have the dinner and learn maybe more about Islam if they like, or just come for the dinner simply. The event also featured guest speakers, a prayer session, and a reading of the Quran. It is typical for Muslims to abstain from food, drink, and sexual activity during daylight hours for the month of Ramadan. The Dawson MSA is organizing another feast on October 9th. Students of every faith are invited to attend. We'll be right back with Concordia Sports after this. You're watching I Am Concordia, your student news source.
Welcome back everyone. It's a special time of year for sports here at Concordia because of the annual homecoming tradition. Sports reporter Giovanni Bertolo was at Saturday's Stingers game and brings us this report. Stinger fans both young and old came out to cheer Concordia's present squad and enshrine the team that 25 years ago captured their first intercollegiate championship. The 1982 Concordia Stingers team along with 1982 league MVP Gerald Prudhomme were all inducted into the Concordia Sports Hall of Fame Saturday. For the former two-time All-Star, it made the homecoming experience even more rewarding knowing he was getting inducted along with his teammates. Uh, it's nice to see all the guys. If the team wouldn't have been uh, inducted, I would have been probably alone there with my family. And Prudhomme acknowledged since his last time stepping foot on Loyola Field, a lot of changes have been made, but some things just so, remain the same. The big change is uh, the field. The field was not uh, an astroturf. Uh, the facilities here, it's terrific. The building didn't change very much. The, the, the inside building where the, 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 the players are training. But uh, Even coach Jerry McGrath right, attempted to coax the, the newest Hall of Fame inductee to join back with the Stingers. I golfed with him yesterday. I was asking if he had any eligibility left. We could get him out there. I'm sure he'd help us. Although the 1982 Stingers alumni were all smiles during the ceremonies, they took the field with heavy hearts. Former Concordia Stinger and 1982 alumnus Nick Benjamin passed away only two months ago after a lengthy battle with kidney disease. He was inducted into the Concordia Sports Hall of Fame in 2005. According to Prudhomme, his presence during the homecoming was surely missed. I was, uh, I heard about that uh, just a few months ago and uh, yeah, something is missing, uh, it's very sad and uh, I knew he was inducted two years ago. Uh, I knew over 3,500 screaming fans attended the 2007 homecoming game and they did not go home disappointed. Although Nick Benjamin was not a part of the festivities, his legacy will live on and so too will the Stingers. From Loyola Field, I'm Giovanni Bertolo. And now we'll toss it back to Giovanni for the sports scores. In the first quarter with the score 3-0 in favor of the Stingers, Concordia's J.P. Binet blocked the Catabay punt attempt and rumbled 25 yards for a Stingers touchdown. In the third quarter, Stingers backup quarterback Liam Mahoney hooked up with Corey Watson for a 13-yard touchdown pass, 19-7 for Concordia. In the fourth quarter, with the score 21-15 for the Stingers, Steven Ladozia's pass was intercepted by Sammy Okpro. Game over, Stingers take the win 21-15. The Stingers will travel to Sherbrooke to take on the Vade All next Saturday. For sports, I'm Giovanni Bertolo. Thanks, Giovanni. It's not often hip-hop is studied at the academic level. But one communications student decided it was time for a change. Aude La Liberté brings us the story. The Orient is in Gomorrah and Sin, hijacked as a water has been, denied back like brothers at the border with Prince. I scan you wouldn't know it, but you're listening to Yassine Al-Salman's Master Thesis in Communications. Presented on September 10th at Concordia, his thesis called Fear of an Arab Planet highlights how young Arabs use hip-hop as a tool to forge their identities. You know, we're the, the new marginalized community that is trying to find a voice in North America. We're the new black, you know, we're the new uh, ethnicity that is under attack. We're public enemy number one. And hip-hop is one of the only mediums where you can be 100% honest and raw with it and people accept it. So. That's why we use it. In addition to an 86-page document, Al Salman's thesis includes a music video and a 12-track hip-hop record. The album was realized using the same technology as old-school hip-hop records. Al Salman knows a lot about hip-hop. He grew up on it. Today, this 25-year-old Iraqi-Canadian juggles his studies with a budding rap career. Scholars like to think they understand the hip-hop generation, but academia is known for being stuffy. After all, the word hip-hop only showed up in the dictionary in 1998. And chances are, you won't see a rap group perform here at the Oscar Peterson Hall anytime soon. But Professor Andrew McCartney thinks that could change. She believes Concordia's communication department is leading the way for unusual projects like Al Salman's. And, um, and the students are doing creative work, but also writing about that work in a scholarly way. So it's that combination of scholarly and creative, which is really unusual. But if it were up to Al Salman's, it wouldn't be unusual. He wants to see hip hop grow as an academic topic beyond communication. You could teach it in communications and music, language, journalism, uh, you know, uh, 
anthropolitics, any of these departments can take hip hop in. And I think that's the most beautiful thing about it. And who knows, maybe one day Al Salman will headline the Oscar Peterson Hall. In Montreal, Amon La Liberté. See, we need order. Wow, if he can do that, maybe I should write my thesis on my drinking habits. <laughs> From what I hear, you'd have lots of material. <laughs> Very funny. Thanks for watching, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving and Ramadan Mubarak. Join us for our next show on Friday, October 26th at 10 a.m. Traditional turkey and gravy dinner. Why not do it with an Italian twist? Our own Amanda Starnino. It's so hard to remember five f***ing lines. Yeah. Wanna master Neo visit a mom, not just any mom?